Hello everyone. Um, my name is, I'm Adi Rane and I'm a junior at South Brunswick High School. And this is our sixth live session th that we're holding. Okay, this is our sixth AP Physics C live session. And I just like to thank you all for coming and thank you all for um, uh, being able to attend. I really hope that uh, these sessions help you in your preparation for the AP exams. Um, today, what we're gonna be doing, so last session we covered mechanics. So this session, uh, we're gonna be doing electricity and magnetism portion of the AP Physics C exam. Um, I remember the last session we covered the graphing portion of the exam. There's always a graph question in the recent exams. Okay, there's always a graph question. And these graph questions uh, sort of uh, mirror an experimental calculation. So it's, it's, they give you a table of values, a data table, and you have to calculate some quantity that uh, you're trying to find. Uh, like the last session, it was a torsion constant of a torsion pendulum. Okay, that was that question. Uh, this time, we're going to be looking at the I think, second question of the 2012 AP Physics C Electricity and Magnetism exam, which is exactly the same thing as, 2000, as the 2011 mechanics question that we did earlier. Okay, so without further ado, let's begin with our lesson. Okay, so this will be your question, and let's get start started. And as you might have already known, if you have any questions while I'm working about a concept that, uh, or an idea or an equation that I may write, uh, please feel free to, there's a chat feature on the, on, on the Zoom uh, menu, there's a chat feature please feel free to type any questions that you may have uh, on the chat feature. And after each part, I will check the chat and answer any questions to the best of my ability. Okay, so if you have any questions while I'm working, you don't have to wait until the very end, but even while I'm working, just type it in. After each part, I will address any and all questions that you may have. Okay, so, no wasting any more time, let's get started. This is question two from the AP Physics C 2012 Electricity and Magnetism exam. Okay, let's read the question. A physics student wishes to measure the resistivity of slightly conductive paper that has a thickness of one times 10 to the negative four meters. The student cuts a sheet of the conductive paper into strips of width 0.02 meters and varying lengths, making five resistors labeled R1 to R5. Using an ohm meter, okay, which I suppose is this device that they give over here, it's an ohm meter. It's an ohm meter. Um, it measure, the student measures the resistance of each strip as shown above. So for each strip, each of the five strips that the student has created using the same material, um, the student has measured the resistances of each strip and the data is given below, the data recorded below. So we're given this data table. Okay, we're given the resistor, R1, R2, R3, R4, R5, its length, and its resistance. Okay, let's go to part A, which I've enlarged over here, just so it'll be easier for us to graph. Now, the, this one is a bit different than yesterday's, even though uh, they tried to test the same concept. The mechanics question, they give you what to graph. They give you the axes. Here, you have to label and scale, the, include the labels and the scales for both axes. So it's entirely 
entirely, you have to create the entire graph, okay? And they're asking us to use the grid below to plot a linear graph of the data point from which the resistivity of the paper can be determined. Include labels and scales for both axes and draw the straight line that best represents the data. Okay, so when we make a graph, when we make a graph, first we need to see what kind of graph. They give us the length and the resistance. So let's start by writing down an equation that includes resistance, length, and resistivity. Okay, and that would be this equation. Okay, the resistance is equal to the resistivity times the length over the area, the cross-sectional area. Okay, so cross-sectional area is if I have a resistor that looks like this. Okay, if I have a resistor that looks like this, then this will be its length. And this area, the, the one I'm going to highlight in blue, this is your cross-sectional area, the area of this blue face. That will be your area, okay? So R equals rho, that's that symbol, it's not a P, it's a rho times L over A, over A. Now, uh, how do we start? Okay, how do we start? Well, you can see that we can create a linear graph. Okay, R equals P over A. And I'm, what I'm going to do is repre replace A, our area, with more uh, things that we already know. Okay, the thickness T, which we know is one times 10 to the negative four, times the width, which we already know is 0 0.02. They give us that information, okay? times L. So if we graph this equation, if we graph this equation with x, the x-axis being measuring the length, the y-axis measuring the resistance, then this quantity, this quantity right here will be the slope. So if we graph, if we graph these points, then, and create a linear graph, then this quantity that I boxed in in blue must be our slope. Okay, so we've decided that our x-axis will be our length, our length in meters, and our y-axis will be our resistance. Okay, it will be our resistance in ohms. So we got our axes down. Now we need to create a scale. Okay, scaling a graph is really important, especially in this case, because you can't scale by one nor can you even scale by a thousand. You need a special scale so that all of these points can be accommodated. Okay, so what can we do here? Now let's look at the length. Okay, if we look at the length over here, you can see that it goes from zero to 0 0.1. Okay, zero to 0 0.1. So what I'm going to do Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to label these uh, 0 0.02 because now you can create any scale you want. Okay, you just have to be mindful of that scale whenever you calculate the slope or anything like that. Oh, I'm zooming in. Okay. So, sorry about that. 0 0.02. 0 0.04 will be this line, 0 0.06, 0 0.08, and 0 0.1. You can also add like 0 0.12, 1, 2 if you want. Okay, that will be our scale. 
So these are in meters. So that will be our X scale. That's what we're going to decide our X scale is going to be. This will be zero, our origin. Okay. Now, what is our, what should we scale for our resistance? Okay, for our resistance. Now, um, you can see it ranges from 80 to 440,000. 80 to 440,000. So how can we scale, how can we scale this accordingly? Okay, how can we scale the graph accordingly? Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add times 10 to the, let's add times 10 to the four. Okay, I'm going to, and the reason why I'm doing this is now I am blowing up, I'm sort of uh, magnifying all the values I put on the vertical axis by 10,000. Okay, because it allows me a lot of space. Okay, it allows me a lot of space. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to label this as uh, this is 10 times 10 to the 4. Okay, let's make it 10 to the 3. So this will be 100, so 100,000. This one will be 200,000. This will be 300,000. This will be 400,000 and this will be 500,000. Okay, and we'll put the top over here. So this is our scale. I'm going to use this scale. And when you're using this scale, you have to be very, very consistent. Okay, if you're not consistent, if you're inconsistent with your scale, then you're going to get the problem wrong. Okay, if you're inconsistent in what your scale is, then you're going to get the problem wrong. Because, because if you don't get the scale right, you will, you will be off by several magnitudes of 10 or uh, 100. Okay, so you have to be careful. Now, let's plot the points according to this scale. For R1, okay, we have 0 0.02 and 80,000. So we have 20, 40, 60, 80. Perfect. Perfect. We got a dead point. So which is why I picked the scale. Okay, all the x values will be on the line. So we don't have to guess for any of those. Now R2, 180,000. Okay, and 0 0.04. 2, 4. Let's count. 2, 4, 6, 8. Okay, so this will be 180,000. Okay, 0 0.04, 180,000. Okay, now let's go to R3, 0 0.06. 0 0.06 is 260,000. So we're going to go to 200,000 right over here. 20, 40, 60. Okay, so now we have 0 0.06 corresponds with 260,000. Bingo. That's what, that's, our, that's what we're getting. Okay. And R4, R4 is 0 0.08, 0 0.08, 370,000. So we have 300, 20, 40, 60. So 70 will be right in between. Right in between. So that's 0 0.08. And 0 0.1 will be 440,000. Okay, so we have 20, 40. Okay, so these are all of our points. So what I need to do is find, okay, find the straight line, draw the straight line that best represents the data. We're gonna use a red pen for this just to make the line a little more visible and use the ruler. Okay, let's use the ruler. So let's see, how can we draw a line that sort of hugs all of these points? Okay, when I mean hug, I mean they should, it should sort of be, so some points are a little above, some points are a little below, it's right in between, so it best represents the data. Okay, so I'm gonna adjust it. 
I'm gonna adjust to try to make it as good as possible. So that is our point as to why we're drawing this line to make our represent, representation of the data as accurate as possible. So a little more or less steep. Okay, so it seems to me that this is a pretty good representation. Let's draw it. And if it's not good, we can, re we can always redraw the line. Okay, so this is our line. And it looks pretty good. It looks pretty decent. Okay, it seems to fit the data quite well. Okay, so how do we find the slope? Okay, because using part B, calculate the resistivity of the paper. Okay, do we have any questions so far? Do we have any questions? Okay, so seeing as there are none, we're going to move on to part B. And part B asks, using the graph, calculate the resistivity of the paper. Now, we calculate the resistivity of the paper. Well, we found to f that in order to find the resistivity, we need to find the slope of this line and the blue box right over here. If we find the slope, if we find the slope, we get our resistivity because we know the thickness T and we know the width W. So first, in order to find a slope, we need some good points. What are some good points that we can use that we're going to highlight in green? Okay, so what are some points that the line directly goes through? Like just, there is no mistake that's going through here. Well, we see this point seems pretty good. Okay, it goes straight through that point. And let's see if there's another point that we can find. Okay, let's search, let's search, let's search, let's search. And this point seems like a pretty good fit. Okay, this point. I typically avoid using the experimental points. Okay, typically try to avoid that. It's but because I could have that that's an estimate according to line. Okay, so we're going to use two separate points and we're going to try to find the slope. Okay, so let's go to part B. The slope of the line is y2, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. And now here's where you have to be really careful. Here's where you have to be really careful. y2 is let's pick y2 is this point okay this is point two now you might be thinking it's 320 wrong okay it is not 320 because remember we scaled this so it's a, so it's easier to read we scaled this so it's 320 thousand okay or 320 times 10 to the three so y2 is 320 times 10 to the 3 ohms. What's y1? y1 is 6 is um, 80, 60. 60 times 10 to the 3 ohms. Okay, and our x2 minus x1, we have to be careful as well. Okay, even though we didn't scale it, so it's a little less room for error. Okay, so you have 0 0.8. So what are each of these markings? Okay, what are each of these markings? Because if we find each of these markings, okay, according to our scale, then it will be really easy for us to find the x value. Now each marking, well, the distance between each of the, oh, sorry about that. The distance between each of these is 0 0.02. So effectively, we're dividing 0 0.02 into five intervals. So 0 0.02 divided by five, okay, 0 0.02 divided by five is equal to 0 0.004.
0 0.004. And I know this seems kind of a uh, tough value, but I chose the scale because now we didn't have to guess any of the initial points. Okay, so here's the payback. We need to use zero point, we need to count by 0 0.004. So over here, 0 0.06, 0 0.064, 0 0.068, 0 0.072. Okay, this is 0 0.076, 0 0.08. So this is 0 0.072 meters minus Okay, our first value, 0 0.004, 0 0.008, 0 0.012, 0 0.016, 0 0.016 meters. And now what do we get? We have 320,000 minus 60,000, okay, divided by 0 0.072, minus 0 0.016 and we get we get right over here 4.64 times 10 to the 6 10 to the 6 ohms per meter that is our slope that is our slope now you have to be careful you have to be careful. This is not the resistivity that we're looking to calculate. This is just the slope of the line. The resistivity can be found using this blue equation, this blue box, because now this has to be equal to our slope. So we're gonna put, set the slope M, it's not mass, this, in this uh, situation it's equal to slope P over TW, thickness times the width. So we get P equals the slope times T times W. And now we get 4.64 times 10 to the 6 ohms per meter times the thickness, which is 1 times 10 to the negative 4, meters times our width. Our width is 0 0.02. And you can see the units start to settle in to the units of uh, resistivity, ohmmeters. So 0 0.001, 0 0.0001 times 0 0.02 we get Okay, we get about 9.2, 9.2 ohm meters. Okay, we get about 9.2 ohm meters. Okay, let's just see if I did everything right. You should get 9.2 ohm meters. Okay. So, let's, uh, do we have any questions on part, uh, on part B, calculating the resistivity? Okay, calculating the resistivity, 9.2. Okay, seeing as there are no questions, Seeing as there are no questions, we can move on to part C. Okay, part C asks, okay, gives us a different situation. The student uses resistors R4 and R5 to build a circuit using wire, a 1.5 volt battery, an uncharged 10 microfarad capacitor, and an open switch as shown above. Part C asks, Calculate the time constant of the circuit. Okay, so they ask us to calculate the time constant of the circuit. So we're going to move right here. The time constant is equal to the resistance times the capacitance. 
But now, because there are two resistors, we have to use the equivalent. You have to use the equivalent resistance, Rx times C. Okay, so the equivalent resistance or the total resistance, okay, I like to use total resistance, one over the total resistance, because now note, when you look at the battery, you look at the circuit, okay, charge branches out. So these two resistors are in parallel. They're in parallel. And now you have to use the according formula, the appropriate formula, okay? They're not in series, they're in parallel. So you have to remember that now you have to use this different formula. So one over RT is one over 370 kilo ohms, 370 kilo ohms, okay? Plus one over, one over 440 kilo ohms. Kilo ohms. Okay, and what do we get? Well, if you add these two fractions together, you have one over 370 plus one over 440. So you get 0 0.00045, okay? Five zero kilo ohms minus one. Okay, and I'd like to put the minus one to remind me that you actually have to invert this. You have to take the reciprocal of this, okay? So taking the reciprocal of this, we get that the total resistance is uh, 201 kilo ohms. That's the equivalent resistance, 201 kilo ohms. Okay, now the time constant, the time constant, now that we found the total resistance, we can find the time constant. So the time constant becomes tau for time constant times the total resistance times C. Okay, so 201 kilo ohms is 2.01 times 10 to the 5 ohms, 10 to the 5 ohms, and we get the capacitance we get the capacitance as, uh, they give us 10 microfarads. So one times 10 to the negative five farads. And because there's times 10 to the five and times 10 to the negative five, this calculation is actually quite easy. You get 2.01 seconds, okay? Time, that's a, the, the time constant is 2.01 seconds. Do we have any questions on how we calculate the time constant? Okay, so um, seeing as there are none, we're going to move on to part D. Okay, part D asks, at time t equals zero, the student closes the switch. On the axes below, sketch the magnitude of the voltage Vc across the capacitors, across the capacitor, and the magnitudes of the voltages VR4 and VR5 across each resistor as functions of time t. Clearly label each curve according to the circuit element it represents. On the axes, explicitly label any intercepts, asymptotes, maxima, or minima with values or expressions as appropriate. Okay, so in order to do this, we need to visualize what happens. Okay, we need to visualize what happens to this circuit. So I'm gonna draw, I'm gonna draw a circuit that looks less confusing than the diagram they give us. So we have our battery. We have our battery and 
it branches off into okay it branches off into two resistors okay two resistors okay and then we have a capacitor capacitor and a switch okay so this is basically the same circuit this is basically the same circuit so what happens okay this is resistor r4 r5 this is 1.5 volts and this is 10 microfarads. This is our switch S. So what happens? When we close the switch, current will start flowing, okay? Because we're, we're given that the capacitor is initially uncharged, okay? So there's no charge on there, okay? So immediately when the switch closes, okay? Current will start flowing out from the 1.5 volt battery, okay? And we'll pass through the R5, R4, pass through the R5, R4 uh, resistors. We'll pile up on this side. Negative charge will be induced on this side, creating a flow of positive current back here. Okay, so now we have um, a current going through and initially, initially because the capacitor is uncharged, there's zero voltage across the capacitor. It has no charge. It has no electric field between it. There is no voltage. So let's, if we go to, we're gonna make, uh, we're going to make pink uh, VC, okay? We're going to make pink VC, and we can see at time t equals zero, there is no voltage, okay? And that means at time t equals zero, we can use the loop rule, Kirchhoff's loop rule, which says that, which says that the sum of the voltages around each, any closed loop, any closed path in a circuit must be equal to zero, okay? Otherwise you would be uh, either having extra energy or would be losing energy for no apparent reason, okay? So that means the voltage of R4, the voltage of R4, the voltage of R4 must equal 1.5 volts. And so does the voltage of R5 has to be equal to 1.5 volts, okay? Because you have, you have this loop, okay? Current goes through this loop and that must be equal to zero. And you have this loop. So both the voltages R4 and R5 must sum to zero, okay? Well, so both voltages R4 and R5 must equal 1.5 volts. Now, that means representing the yellow one, if we label this 1.5 volts, that's where the resistors start. That's where the resistors start, both R4 and R5. Now, next what I'm going to do is show that R4, the voltage across R4 must equal the voltage across R5. You might already know this or realize this because they're in parallel, but you can show that using the same loop rule. This is also a closed loop. Okay, this is also a closed loop. So, VR4 minus VR5 must equal zero. Okay, when current is, when you draw a loop, it loses voltage here, 
but because it goes opposite to the actual current here, we're gonna gain voltage. Okay, so we have this equation over here, and this gives us VR4 equals VR5. So we only need one line to represent uh, the voltages of the resistors. Now, what happens? What happens to the current as charge starts to accumulate? Well, over time, the voltage of the voltage of the capacitor starts to gain increase. It starts to increase because the voltage, because the charge on the capacitor plate starts to accumulate. Okay, thus creating an electric field and thus creating a potential difference. Okay, so the voltage starts to increase, but in what shape? Well, for a capacitor, for a capacitor, it will be exponentially increase, increasing, but it's a specific type of exponential growth. Okay, it will be, it will be asymptotic. Okay, or asymptotic. And what that means is that the voltage across the capacitor will start to, let's use the pink, be consistent. The voltage across the capacitor will start to approach 1.5, but can't go above 1.5, otherwise it would violate the loop rule. So it starts to approach 1.5 like this, okay? It will increase sharply, but as the capacitor starts nearing full charge, full capacity, the rate at which voltage increases will start to flatten. The curve will flatten like this. Okay, so this will be VC. Okay, this will be VC. Now, as the voltage, as the voltage across the capacitor, across a capacitor starts to increase, the voltages across the resistors has to start to decrease because of the loop rule. If it just stayed the same or increased, then the sum of the voltages will be non-zero, violating Kirchhoff's loop rule. So as a result, you start to see an exponential decay because VC was exponential growth you start to see exponential decay and the voltage starts approaching zero because now the capacitor starts to gobble up all the voltage, okay? It starts to gobble up, it starts to, as the voltage starts to increase, it starts to approach the battery's voltage. It starts to become full. And as that is happening, as that's happening, the resistors can, is starting to lose their voltage. The current is starting to decrease because now the charge in the capacitor is starting to become full. So this will be VR4 and VR5 because we just saw that they're both equal. Okay, and we'll draw an asymptote just to show that this is approaching. Okay, and this is approaching zero. Okay, so this will be your graph. This will be your graph. Okay, do we have any questions so far on the questions, comments? Do we have any questions whatsoever on the, uh, on how we found out these two graphs? Okay, seeing as there are none, we're going to go back. Okay, we're going to go back. Okay, we're going to go back. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for coming uh, to this session. I'm really glad that all of you were able to join. Please take note that uh, because my spring break is starting to um, end, that tomorrow will be our last live session. Okay, tomorrow will be a last uh, confirmed live session after that. I will still try to do live sessions, but only when time permits. So tomorrow will be our last confirmed time session. Please do leave feedback and suggestions on today's session so I can uh, try to make these better each time. Okay, so tomorrow will be our last session. I will try to post the video or at least the link of the video 
on the Facebook page. So I urge you to share my Facebook page, like the Facebook page so you can get the videos and get 